Welcome back. In this session, we're going to be talking about the control of ventilation. And it's a remarkable fact that the gas exchange of the lung is so carefully regulated in spite of considerable differences in activity during the 24 hours, rest, exercise, sleep. Uh, in spite of that, the PCO2 of the arterial blood is probably kept to within three or four millimeters of mercury over the whole period. And this remarkable degree of regulation of gas exchange is brought about by the control of ventilation. And in this rather whimsical cartoon you can see at the bottom right there, that shows the uh, way in which the blood gases are being uh, scrutinized and ventilation is altered as a result. So let's look first of all at the system, the respiratory control system, which is shown here. And we can start with the sensors, bottom left. And these look at the gas exchange in the blood. We've got what are called chemoreceptors, and I'll go into those in some detail. They look at the levels of PO2, PCO2, pH in the blood. You've got receptors also in the lung, which look at the movement of the lung, and other receptors as well, for example, from exercising muscles. And these sensors send an input to the central controller in the brain. Now the central controller, as, we see, as we'll see, is mainly located in the brain stem, the medulla and the pons, but there are also influences from other parts of the brain. And that's where the information from the sensors is processed and the brain works out what the body really wants in terms of gas exchange. And so the output of the central controller goes to the effectors. The effectors are the muscles of respiration. Now, of course, we've dealt with them in some detail. We're not going to spend a lot of time on those now, but we'll just uh, review briefly the respiratory muscles. Now one of the important features of this respiratory control system is that it is a negative feedback system. What do I mean by that? Well suppose the PCO2 in the blood starts to rise, perhaps because during sleep there's some obstruction to breathing. As a result of that, the sensors will send, the chemoreceptors will recognize the increase in PCO2 in the blood, and they'll send the information to the central controller, and the central controller will increase the ventilation by increasing the output to the respiratory muscles. The result of the increase in ventilation is to reduce the arterial PCO2, and in that way, the system is returned to its normal situation. So that's an example of negative feedback. Now let's look at the central controller in more detail. And here, first of all, is a very simple diagram of the brain for those of us who don't see it all the time. Uh, the brain uh, has a brain stem made up of the medulla, or the medulla oblongata, and the pons. The medulla is an extension of the spinal cord, as you can see here. And then there are other parts of the brain, the midbrain, the forebrain, and so on. But we're going to be mainly concerned with the medulla and the pons, although, as, we, as we'll see, there are influences coming from the forebrain, uh, uh, the cortex, uh, 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 under some conditions. So let's look at the rhythm controllers in the brainstem. Now I have to say that I find this a somewhat confusing area, partly because so much research work is going on all the time. People are still working out the details of the, uh, the, the central pattern generator, the controlling system in the brain. Uh, but this is, I think, a reasonable way of looking at it, taking into account the more classical statements that have been made and, and some more recent uh, work. And so in the medulla, we've got two groups of cells. They're sometimes called respiratory centers, although people don't particularly like that term. These are, these are a collection of cells. And one is the dorsal respiratory group in the medulla, 
dorsal meaning towards the back in the upright man. Uh, the dorsal respiratory group, and these seem to be particularly associated with inspiration. Then we've also got a ventral respiratory group of neurons, which seem to be particularly associated with expiration. Now, more recently, people have spent a good deal of time working on a thing called the pre-Botzinger complex. And this is thought to be very critical in terms of the central pattern generator. It's also located somewhat ventrally in the medulla. And people of uh, researchers have carried out experiments on newborn animals where they've taken slices of the brain and shown that they can pick up areas in this pre-Botzinger complex which are undergoing uh, intrinsic rhythm. In other words, they can put an electrode on this group of neurons and show that it is, is a, uh, an intrinsic pattern generator, um, a little bit like the, uh, the, um, uh, the heart, which has a, a, a generator. So the pre-Botzinger complex now is being studied very extensively, and some people believe that that probably is where the, the intrinsic rhythm the central pattern generator uh, uh, is located. As we've learned uh, from previous uh, sessions, uh, during resting breathing, inspiration is active, but expiration is passive. Uh, during expiration, the lung returns to its normal, the normal equilibrium position for the lung and chest wall. And so if you look at the output of the phrenic nerve, for example, what you'll find is that the impulses coming from the brain gradually increase in frequency during inspiration in a sort of ramp type pattern. And then at the end of inspiration, the impulses go away. And during expiration, the system is quiescent. Of course, on exercise, when, ex when expiration has to be active, then expiratory impulses also occur. Now in the ponds, there are two groups of neurons, centers, that classically have been thought to uh, be important, although exactly how important they are in normal breathing is, is still, in, in humans, is still not clear because all these experiments uh, necessarily are done on animals. And in the lower ponds, there's a thing called the apneustic center, which is thought to have an excitatory function. If you section the brain of an animal above the apneustic center, you get a series of prolonged gasping inspirations. And occasionally patients with severe brain injury will show the same pattern. So under some conditions, the apneustic center may be important. And there's also a thing called the pneumotaxic center, higher in the ponds. And it's thought that this can inhibit inspiration under some conditions and possibly the pneumotaxic center uh, is, is uh, associated with the fine control of the frequency of breathing. But I, I should emphasize that I, I think most people who work in this area still don't fully understand the rhythm control in the, in, uh, the human, um, because most of this work has been done on animals. Now, in addition, in addition to these controllers in the brain stem, other regions of the brain can affect respiration, and we should just mention these. First of all, the cortex is very important, and we're all familiar with that. We know that we can hyperventilate if we want to. In fact, it's not difficult to hyperventilate over uh, a, a minute or two, and you can drop your PCO2 in the arterial blood to close to, the, to half the normal value. Uh, hyperventilation is very effective in changing gas exchange. Hypoventilation, uh, for example, breath holding, is much more difficult. Although there are some of these uh, divers who go down to great depths now, uh, breath hold diving, and they can hold their breath for many, many minutes. So uh, under some conditions, humans can uh, control their uh, hypoventilation as well as their hyperventilation. In addition to that, there is the limbic system and the hypothalamus, and these have to do with emotional states, and we're all familiar with the fact that someone uh, who um, is very excited or 
uh, is very afraid, or something like that, they will change their ventilatory pattern and that's because of input from these other systems. So that's the, all I need to say, I think, about the central pattern generator, the, the, the respiratory control system and the central pattern generator in the brain. And now let's move to the effectors, which are the muscles of respiration. Now, as I said, we don't need to spend much time on these because we looked at these in detail in the session on ventilation. And uh, uh, just to recap though, the most important muscle of inspiration is the diaphragm, you recall. And one of the important things about the diaphragm is that it's supplied by phrenic, mus phrenic nerves which originate high in the cervical region of the spinal cord, so that damage to the spinal cord in the thoracic region, for example, uh, spares the, uh, um, the, uh, the phrenic nerves and uh, therefore breathing can continue. And that's very important in the uh, survival of people who develop this kind of injury. In addition, inspiration is assisted by the external intercostal muscles, you recall. Um, Expiration is normally passive, as we've said, but during exercise, for example, when, when expiration becomes active, then the abdominal muscles become particularly important. They're the most important muscles of expiration. They're assisted by the internal intercostals. And we shouldn't forget also the accessory muscles of ventilation, muscles in the neck, for example, which support the uh, upper ribs, the first rib particularly, uh, but they come into play uh, during vigorous exercise, for example, and also patients who are severely short of breath can be seen to be using the accessory muscles. So we don't need to say any more now about the effectors. Let's move on and talk about the, the sensors, and this is a, a much uh, bigger topic. So the sensors can be divided into four main categories. First of all, there's the central chemoreceptor that I'm going to be talking about in detail. Then we've got two sets of peripheral chemoreceptors. We've got receptors coming from the lung, sensing the expansion of the lung, for example, and other receptors coming from muscles, uh, um, limb movement, and, and uh, and uh, baroreceptors, other sensors as well, which we'll mention briefly. So let's now move to the uh, central chemoreceptor. And first of all, what do we mean by a chemoreceptor? Well, a chemoreceptor consists of specialized tissue that responds to a change in the chemical composition of the blood or some other fluid. And in fact, we'll see that as, as far as the central chemoreceptor is concerned, it's the extracellular fluid of the brain that's the important fluid. Uh, as far as the peripheral chemoreceptors are concerned, it's the arterial blood that is the uh, fluid that is sensed. So we've got the central chemoreceptor and the two peripheral chemoreceptors. Let's look at the central chemoreceptor. Now here's a nice diagram showing the central chemoreceptor which is embedded in brain tissue, as you can see. It's in the ventral part of the medulla. It's actually only a few millimeters below the surface. And if you take a pledget of uh, cotton wool, which has some acid or CO2 solution on it and place it on this part of the brain, this part of the medulla, then you can see in animal preparations a, a rapid increase in ventilation uh, occurs within a few seconds. So there's a central chemoreceptor uh, embedded in the brain tissue here, and this is a, a very important receptor. In fact, this is the, the central chemoreceptor is responsible for most of the minute-by-minute -minute control of ventilation over the 24 hours. The central chemoreceptor responds to pH in the extracellular fluid, which essentially is the pH of the cerebral spinal fluid here, CSF, meaning cerebral spinal fluid. We can't get at the extracellular fluid easily, but the cerebral spinal fluid is easily uh, looked at. We can put a needle into the space and take some of it out if we wish. And it's the pH of the CSF which 
uh, apparently has a large effect on the response of the chemoreceptor. Chemoreceptor also depends to some extent on the blood flow through the brain perhaps, and, uh, but mainly uh, and metabolism, local metabolism perhaps, but it's mainly the pH of the CF, CSF that's important. And the way it works is that you have blood in one of the smaller blood vessels in the brain. It turns out that the blood vessels in the brain have a remarkable barrier called the blood gas barrier, which limits the permeability of many substances across the wall of these blood vessels. These cerebral blood vessels are special in that regard. And for example, they don't allow hydrogen ions or bicarbonate ions to permeate this blood gas barrier. On the other hand, molecular CO2 can easily diffuse out from this central region, from the, from the lumen of the blood vessel, into the extracellular fluid and into the uh, CSF, and an increase in PCO2, of course, will reduce the pH, will increase the hydrogen ion concentration, and uh, will reduce the pH of the CSF. So the sequence is that if the PCO2 in the arterial blood increases, more CO2 diffuses out into the CSF, the pH is decreased and this stimulates the chemoreceptor. Now, the, the pH of the CSF is normally uh, about 7.32. It's rather lower than that of blood, which of course has a pH normally of about 7.4. So the pH of the CSF is, is lower and also the buffering uh, ability of the CSF is much less than that in the blood. The CSF contains a lower protein concentrations, so a given change in PCO2 will cause a larger change in pH. Uh, other uh, things in the blood, the other blood gases do not affect the central chemoreceptor. Uh, for example, the PO2 as far as we know, does not affect the central chemoreceptor, and pH, unless it's uh, possibly moved over very large uh, changes, also does not affect the pH of the CSF, and therefore not, does not affect the function of the chemoreceptor. So this, the chemoreceptor basically is governed by the CO2 level in the blood via its effect on the pH. An interesting thing happens if somebody is hyperventilating or hypoventilating for a long period. This sometimes occurs in, uh, and, and therefore the CO2 rises. The CO2 sometimes rises in patients with chronic lung disease. Uh, but under those conditions, if the CO2 rises over a long period of time, and of course that causes initially a reduction in pH, the pH can be restored to near normal in the CSF by an organ called the choroid plexus. Think of the choroid plexus of the CSF like the kidney of the blood. The choroid plexus controls, regulates the composition of the CSF. And so if the pH is moved, is, if, for example, if the CO2 is, increases over a period because of chronic lung disease over a long period, pH initially falls, but the CSF bicarbonate then can be reduced and that can bring this, the pH back to near normal. And so what you often find in these patients is that they may have a chronically raised PCO2 in the arterial blood, sometimes known as respiratory failure, and yet the pH of the CSF is near normal and therefore their ventilation is not nearly so uh, in, is not increased nearly as much as you would expect from the level of the PCO2. So let's summarize some of the statements we've made about the central chemoreceptor. As I've said it, uh, and this is here mainly if you want to come back and just review this, it responds to the pH of the extracellular fluid, which is broadly speaking that of the cerebral spinal fluid. Uh, the mechanism is that the CO2 diffuses across the blood brain barrier, thus changing the pH of the uh, ECS for the cerebral spinal fluid. The normal pH of the cerebral spinal fluid is about 7.32. It has 
little buffering power because of its low protein concentration and the bicarbonate is controlled by the choroid plexus and can be altered if the pH of the CSF is changed over a long period of time. So that's the central chemoreceptor, very, very important factor in the respiratory control system. Now let's look at the peripheral chemoreceptors. And there are two sites of the peripheral chemoreceptors. The first is the carotid body, which is at the junction, uh, the bifurcation of the carotid, the common carotid artery, divides into internal and external uh, car carotid arteries, and that's where the chemoreceptors are located. They're very tiny, by the way. They're very, very small. Uh, that's where they uh, occur. The others are the aortic body chemoreceptors near the aortic arch, as you can see here. These are not so important in humans. The, the more important of the two groups is the uh, carotid body chemoreceptors. And you'll also see that the, and incidentally, the information from the carotid body chemoreceptors goes to the brain via the glossopharyngeal nerve, that's nerve number nine, whereas the information from the aortic body chemoreceptors uh, is inputted to the brain via the vagus, that's uh, cranial nerve number 10. You'll also see that close to the chemoreceptors are baroreceptors. We're not going to say much about those. They're much more important in cardiovascular physiology. I hear a lot about them there. But it is true that baroreception does affect the, the chemoreceptors uh, as well. Uh, they, they meet, the, the outputs meet in the brain, and, and we'll say a little bit more about that in a moment. So let's look at the carotid body chemoreceptor in more detail. Here's a diagram of the carotid body chemoreceptor. You can see there are two types of cells. These are called glomus cells, and the type 1 glomus cells uh, show a, a, a strong fluorescent reaction uh, because of the presence of high concentrations of dopamine in them. And there are also type 2 glomus cells as well. Now, we're not sure about the exact mechanism of chemoreception, uh, the response to the PO2, which is the important thing for these peripheral chemoreceptors, but it's generally agreed that one or two of these cells uh, respond to the PO2, and the information is then sent to the central nervous system, the CNS here, and that's done, as we said, through a branch of the glossopharyngeal nerve. The carotid body has a very high blood flow, one of the highest blood flows in relation to its mass of any organ in the body. Having said that, the mass is very small, but, but the blood flow in terms of the mass is very high, and so the carotid body uh, chemoreceptor responds essentially to the arterial PO2. It, it doesn't matter too much what the venous PO2 is, it's the arterial PO2 because the blood flow is so high, uh, plenty of oxygen, and so it's the arterial PO2 that uh, governs the response of the carotid body chemoreceptor. That's important in some conditions. For example, in carbon monoxide poisoning, where the blood may have a lot of carbon monoxide on board, and therefore uh, the oxygen concentration of the arterial blood is relatively low. Nevertheless, the PO2 of the arterial blood is normal, and therefore the carotid body chemoreceptor is not particularly uh, uh, stimulated because it's looking at the arterial PO2, which is normal, and therefore breathing is, is uh, typically not increased in carbon monoxide poisoning. Now the output of the carotid body chemoreceptor, uh, the, the response that goes up to the brain here, plotted against, is plotted against the arterial PO2 here, and you can see it's very non-linear, although it is interesting that there is some response of the carotid body chemoreceptor even at very high PO2s, and that's uh, quite special amongst tissues of the body. But in, by and large, the response under normic, normoxic conditions is very, very small, and therefore the carotid body chemoreceptor is not important in the normal control of ventilation when we're breathing air at uh, 
at the sea level. Uh, we're under normoxic conditions and, and the response of the receptor is not important there. But as you reduce the arterial PO2, for example, by going to high altitude, then the, uh, incre then the response increases rapidly, as you can see. So it's a, a very nonlinear response. So again, just to recap on that, uh, first of all, I didn't say, and I shall say it now, that the, then it, in addition to the PO2, which is very important for the carotid body, the carotid body also responds to PCO2 and pH. Its response to PCO2 is less than that of the central chemoreceptors, perhaps uh, one-fifth as much response uh, of ventilation to a change in PCO2, an increase in PCO2, for example, uh, only about a fifth of the increase in ventilation comes from the peripheral chemoreceptors, particularly the carotid body, although the, the response is rapid. And so uh, uh, if you've got a rapid change in PCO2, then the carotid body is important. And in fact, there's some evidence that even during the breathing cycle, the change in the carotid body response because of the very small alterations in in alveolar and therefore arterial PCO2 with the breathing cycle, uh, apparently the carotid body can respond to those. Little response, and, and it also, also responds to pH as well. And that's important. I, I mentioned that the central chemoreceptor does not respond to the pH of the arterial blood, at least under most conditions, but the, the uh, carotid body does, and, and that is important, uh, for example, in metabolic acidosis. The increase in, in uh, ventilation is caused by the action of the carotid body. Little response in normoxia, as I said. I emphasize the very high blood flow in relation to the, uh, the mass of the organ. It responds, therefore responds to arterial, not venous PO2, and it's got a fast response. So those are some of the features of the carotid body. Now, in addition to the chemoreceptors, ventilation is affected by lung receptors. And there are several of these, and they're listed here. First of all, there are the pulmonary stretch receptors. Now, the, the ends of, the, uh, of the, the receptors themselves are probably in the wall of the airways, and they respond to the increase in volume of the lung. Some people call these slowly adapting pulmonary stretch receptors. Sometimes you'll see that term rather than stretch receptors. I personally happen to prefer stretch receptor, but uh, a lot of people call them slowly adapting. And that means that if you change the signal on the receptor, if you change the, uh, for example, the volume of the lung, uh, the receptor will maintain responding at that increased level. That's a slowly adapting one, whereas a rapidly adapting receptor will initially increase its output and then it'll return towards normal. Now there's a, a classical reflex that should be mentioned, that's called the Herring-Brewer reflex. And the Herring-Brewer or Breuer reflex uh, has to do with the fact that if you inflate the lung, then you inhibit further movement of the lung, further inflation. Uh, the animal will stop breathing sometimes. And that, that can be demonstrated, particularly in, in the rabbit, uh, uh, using the rabbit as a, uh, uh, an experimental animal, because there's a, a little slip of the diaphragm that you can uh, measure the uh, tension in, and uh, that's the herring Breuer reflex. You, you can see it's also an example of, of uh, negative feedback because as you, when you expand the lung, the reflex tends to prevent further expansion and further ventilation. Uh, and it was very, a, a very classical reflex. It was, uh, it was described way back in, I think, the 1880s. I can't remember exactly when, uh, by uh, Breuer. Breuer was the graduate student who actually did the work. Herring was his boss, so his name is attached to it. Um, but, they, uh, but that was one of the first reflexes uh, demonstrated in, in, uh, in physiology, actually, and particularly in respiratory physiology. And uh, it was, was recognized that it had a negative feedback uh, function. In addition to that, there are these irritant re receptors, which uh, are sometimes called rapidly adapting stretch receptors. Now, that 
name is given because although these mainly respond to irritants such as inhaled cigarette smoke, uh, smog, uh, toxic gases, uh, cold air, these all stimulate the irritant receptors which are in the bronchial walls. Um, some people believe that they also respond to lung stretch as well and that's why uh, they're given this name. Uh, the, the result of these is often to cause bronchoconstriction and in fact some people think that the irritant receptors play an important part in asthma which is a disease causing uh, severe constriction of the airways. Uh, but you'll find for example, and you'll find for example in, in asthma, patients with asthma often will develop an attack if they breathe cold air for example. Uh, and uh, that probably the irritant receptors are important there. There are also J receptors or juxtacapillary receptors as you, as you can see here. The J receptors, the endings of the J receptors are in the alveolar wall, very close to the capillaries. The evidence for that is that if you inject a substance into the pulmonary circulation, you get a very rapid response of these J receptors. And the J receptors apparently cause rapid shallow breathing. And these may be important in some pathological conditions. For example, uh, in, uh, in pulmonary edema, where you get engorgement, a lot of fluid, in the region around the pulmonary capillaries, the fluid leaks out of the capillaries into the interstitial space, it can presumably stimulate these juxtacapillary receptors and causes uh, rapid shallow breathing. And rapid shallow breathing is very much a feature of uh, pulmonary edema. People with pulmonary edema become very short of breath, very dyspneic as it's called, short of breath. Uh, also, this may be true in patients with interstitial lung disease where the collagen is laid down in the alveolar wall and this may well, we're not certain, but we think probably this stimulates the J receptors and those patients typically have very rapid shallow breathing. So uh, that may be uh, one of the ways in which the J receptors work. There are also the bronchial C fibers these are apparently similar to the J receptors except that they are supplied by the bronchial circulation. So those are the lung receptors. But there are other receptors as well. There are receptors in the nose and the upper airway. Some of these are very like the irritant receptors. And for example, if you, uh, if you breathe um, very cold air, the upper airway may cause bronchoconstriction. Uh, if you breathe a, a noxious gas, a small amount of chlorine, for example, you may get constriction of the uh, airways of the lung. There are also receptors from the joints and the muscles of the body, and these may be important in the increase in ventilation that occurs with exercise. There's a thing called the gamma system, which has to do with sensing the elongation of muscles. And some people believe that the gamma system may be important in the sensation of dyspnea. Dyspnea means the sensation of shortness of breath, difficulty, difficulty with breathing. And some people think that the gamma system may be important there, um, uh, uh, although that's not certain. I mentioned the baroreceptors, and we saw that the, the baroreceptors are, are, are close, anatomically close, to the chemoreceptors. Uh, the, the peripheral chemoreceptors. And the, the baroreceptors do play a role to some extent in uh, the control of ventilation. For example, uh, we showed uh, in some experiments done on astronauts in space, and I'll mention those in a later uh, session very briefly, we showed that the, the ventilatory response to PO2 is reduced in space compared with people standing uh, at sea level. And that's because the baroreceptors in space are sensing a higher pressure in the blood vessels. That's because of the return of the, the because the, the, the blood volume of the upper part of the body is increased in space because there's no uh, dependent uh, pooling of blood. And uh, that's an interesting little feature that the the, uh, the response to PO2, which normally, of course, is 
done by the peripheral chemoreceptors that was modified in space. And also there are receptors that pick up changes in pain and temperature and we're all familiar with that. Uh, a sudden pain will cause a gasp and perhaps a, uh, a period of, of, uh, of breath holding for example. Uh, so these receptors are also important. Okay, now I've dealt with the main components of the respiratory console system. We looked at the First of all, we looked at, we, we looked at the um, uh, central controller in some detail in the brain. We then looked at the effectors, the muscles of respiration, and we looked at the sensors, particularly the chemosensors, but other sensors as well. And now we're going to turn to the integrated responses. And here is the ventilatory response to carbon dioxide. So, in this plot, we have ventilation on this axis with the PCO2 here. And as you can see, as you increase the alveolar PCO2, so the ventilation increases. And incidentally, in experiments like this, which where the lung is normal, we normally use the alveolar value as a measure of the arterial value. And you can also see that the slope of the line depends on the alveolar PO2. For example, if we drop the alveolar PO2 to around about 37 millimeters of mercury, there's a very steep increase in the rate of ventilation with a change in PCO2, much more so than when the P PO2 is uh, the normal value of 100 or even increased to 169 here. So there's interaction between the two stimuli here, the PO2 and the PCO2. Of course, the ventilatory response to CO2 is partly, the, mainly, the, the central chemoreceptors. The peripheral chemoreceptors make some, some uh, additional response. Uh, the change, the, the PO2, is only sensed by the peripheral chemoreceptors. Now, this ventilatory response to CO2 is very important. In fact, it is the level of CO2 in the blood that normally controls ventilation over the 24 hours of activity. This, it's the CO2 that's the most important variable. And we can summarize some of the features here. As I say, it's the primary factor in the control of ventilation. How do we measure it? Well, we can measure it by having a subject rebreathe from a bag. In other words, it's connected to a rubber bag which contains some CO2 and uh, as he inhales the CO2, his ventilation increases, and then as he adds CO2 to the bag, because he's producing it from his tissues, so the PCO2 rises, and we can look at the response, the ventilator response to the increase in PCO2. So that's a, a way of measuring the ventilatory response to carbon dioxide. We can also measure this, and I won't go into detail, using a technique where you, you suddenly occlude the airway during an inspiration. Now, you only do that for a very short period of time, but the inspiratory effort at the point of occlusion is measured, the pressure, and that pressure gives you a, uh, a measure of the response to CO2. So that's another way of measuring the response to CO2. The CO2 response is altered by a number of factors. I've put a couple of them here. In sleep, for example, the response to CO2 is reduced. So typically, the PCO2 will rise by one or two millimeters or three millimeters of mercury during sleep. Uh, the, the response to CO2 is reduced. Increasing age tends to reduce the ventilator response to CO2. And there are genetic factors as well. In fact, there's there's a big difference, individual difference, between people in their response to CO2. In fact, if we go back to this previous slide, the, the, this, what we're seeing here is a, a mean of, of uh, a number of measurements, but there's a good deal of variation between people, and that may be important in some kinds of lung disease. Uh, the CO2 response also may be affected uh, by training. We do know that for example, swimmers tend to have a reduced ventilatory response to carbon dioxide, and that may be part of the effects of training. It's also reduced by increasing the work of breathing. For example, if you ask someone to breathe 
through a narrow tube and you therefore cause respiratory obstruction, airflow obstruction, and the work of breathing is increased, uh, those people will show a reduced ventilator response to CO2 and that may be important in lung disease. Okay, so that's the response to CO2. Let's turn to the ventilatory response to PO2. Now here we've got measurements of ventilation here. Uh, ventilation measured against the PO2. And as you can see, as the alveolar PO2 falls, the ventilation increases. Now with a normal alveolar PO2, 36 or so, uh, normally about 40, there's almost no response until we get to an alveolar PO2 of 60 or so and it starts to rise. And that reinforces what I said earlier, that the normal level of ventilation under normal noxic conditions is not affected by the PO2 or the response of the chemoreceptors. But it's interesting that if you raise the PCO2, then the response to PO2 uh, occurs at lower values. Here we've only raised the P the PCO2 to 43.7 millimeters of mercury, but now you can see the response occurs at a relatively high level of uh, PO2, and this is even more marked when the PCO2 is raised to 48.7. So again, we're, we can see an interaction between the two uh, stimuli, the PCO2 on the one hand and the PO2 on the other. The response to reduced PO2, as I said, no role under normoxic conditions. It can also be measured by rebreathing from a bag. Uh, you have a bag containing uh, a low oxygen mixture and as you continue to rebreathe from it, the PO2 falls because you're using up some of the oxygen and uh, you can measure the uh, response, the ventilatory response to the PO2 or the arterial oxygen saturation, which is often done. I've mentioned that its response uh, is increased if the PCO2 is raised. There is an interaction between these the two uh, groups of sti uh, stimuli. Uh, it's particularly important at high altitude, and we'll see that in a later session. At, when you go to high altitude, the ventilation increases uh, a great deal, as a matter of fact, at extreme altitude, and this is brought about by the peripheral chemoreceptors. In fact, uh, some years ago, uh, some patients uh, were treated for, I think it was asthma, they were treated by removing the peripheral chemoreceptors or the, the, carotid, chem the carotid body receptors. Uh, it was not a good idea, but it was done. And it was shown that these patients had no ventilator res response to a low PO2. And that was a, a nice proof in, in humans that the ventilatory response to PO2 is mainly comes from the carotid body and certainly all of it comes from the chemoreceptors. Uh, the res response to an, a reduced PO2 is important in some patients with chronic lung disease. I'm not going to go into this in detail, but some patients with very severe lung disease have an increased PCO2 and a very low PO2. And in some of those patients, a lot of the drive to breathe is coming from the low arterial PO2. Not so, of course, under normoxin conditions, as I've emphasized, but in these patients with a chronically reduced arterial PO2, some of the derived ventilation comes from the low arterial PO2. That's important because if these patients are admitted to or come into the emergency room and are given oxygen to breathe, which is, sounds like a very reasonable thing to do because their arterial PO2 is very low, they may stop breathing or they may reduce their breathing to a very large extent. And this is well recognized. So what you need to do in these patients is monitor the PO2, the arterial PO2 and the arterial PCO2 carefully. And you normally give a relatively small increase in oxygen. You don't give them 100% oxygen to breathe. You give them 24, perhaps 28% oxygen uh, and uh, monitor their blood gases. So those are the responses to PO2. What about the responses to pH? Well, these are not so important under normal conditions, but a reduced pH is sensed by the peripheral chemoreceptors, as I mentioned, uh, probably particularly the carotid chemoreceptors. Of course, when the PCO2 rises, there is normally a fall in pH, uh, 
and this is part of the stimulus to the peripheral chemoreceptor and actually often it's quite difficult to sort out whether it is the PCO2 or the reduced pH which is responsible for the increased ventilation. But that's well seen in patients with metabolic acidosis that you'll remember we talked about when we reviewed the acid-base status of the body. In metabolic acidosis, the pH of the blood is low, there's acidemia, and often the PCO2 is low. So in those patients, the increase in ventilation clearly is coming from the, the reduction in pH. Uh, it's also believed, I, I mentioned that the that pH works through the peripheral chemoreceptors, but there's some evidence that if the arterial pH is sufficiently reduced to a very low level, the central chemoreceptors may be stimulated and, and maybe some of the change in pH leaks across the blood-brain blood, blood barrier, uh, which as I said, normally uh, that doesn't happen. Let's turn now to the response to exercise. And this is a somewhat unsatisfactory area because I'm embarrassed to tell you that, at least in my opinion, we still don't fully understand the ventilatory response to exercise. Now, that's a very remarkable statement, isn't it? Um, and uh, since all of us exercise and all of us are very much aware of the increase in ventilation when we exercise, but the reasons for the increase in ventilation are, are still not fully understood. First of all, the blood gases are normal during exercise, or at least in moderate exercise. When you go up to very severe exercise, blood gases may change a bit, but uh, in moderate exercise, uh, the blood gases are normal. The PCO2 is normal, the pH is normal. The, 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 P, the PCO2, the PO2, and the pH are all normal in moderate exercise. The pH is normal except at very heavy exercise. Now, at very heavy exercise, you can get lactic acid production and this will reduce the pH of the blood and as a matter of fact, and we'll be talking about exercise uh, a little bit in a later session, uh, in very heavy exercise the ventilation increases much more than you might expect uh, and that is because of the lactate. But that does not occur in moderate exercise. There's a small amount of lactate but it's very small in moderate exercise. So what is responsible for the ventilatory response to exercise? Well, some people have suggested that it may be impulses coming from the cortex. Uh, we're aware of the fact we're exercising and we increase our ventilation correspondingly. And it's interesting that if you have a, uh, if you have a dog as a pet and you say to the dog, uh, let's go walkies, uh, the dog immediately starts ventilating, okay? He hasn't done anything yet. Uh, he just heard the term walkies and is uh, aware of the fact that he's going to have some exercise who he starts to ventilate. So clearly the cortex is important. Some people will think that impulses from limbs are important in exercise. There's an increase in temperature of the body in exercise. That may be a factor. It's possible that, the, that there's a resetting of the CO2 reference level. In other words, we normally have the CO2 reference level at, at 40, maybe it's reset uh, uh, on exercise, and, and that's the reason why ventilation increases, even though the PCO2 remains uh, constant, uh, according to our, our normal thinking. So the, uh, the answer to all this is we don't fully understand what the response of ventilation to exercise is caused by, and uh, maybe one of you, one of you out there uh, we'll get a Nobel Prize one of these days from uh, sorting that out. Now I'm going to finish by talking briefly about abnormal ventilation. I'm not going to go into this in detail, but I do want to say a little bit about sleep apnea because it's a very important topic and it occurs in essentially normal people. You may say, well, you're talking pathophysiology. Well, we're not meant, of course, to go into periods of apnea when we sleep, but but relatively normal people do. And the commonest cause of, and, and it's, it's extremely common. Um, it's interesting that it, it's only been recognized in the last 15 or 20 years how common it is, but it's now recognized that it's extremely common and you'll find sleep clinics all over the country uh, helping people who develop sleep apnea. The commonest cause of sleep apnea is obstruction. And it's obstruction caused by by, by tissue in the pharynx, which falls in during sleep and 
partially obstructs the airway. And snoring, of course, is a very uh, common feature of this obstruction. It's often associated with obesity, although not always. Certainly it was uh, initially described in obese people, but uh, now people who are not obese uh, frequently suffer from sleep apnea. It's important because it may result in sleep deprivation, which causes, as it says here, daytime somnolence, um, so that you get people who are sleepy. And obviously that's a serious problem if you're a truck driver, for example, and you, you tend to drop off uh, during the day. Uh, that's a very serious problem. And in fact, some people have changes, and they've been measured, changes of cognitive function as a result of, of sleep deprivation. And also there are changes in behavior patterns. Some people become, uh, they change their emotional states because of sleep deprivation. So it's, a, it's an important area, um, perhaps not completely uh, normal physiology, but it certainly occurs very frequently in people who otherwise appear to be normal. So it's something we should mention. There's also a form of sleep apnea called central sleep apnea. Uh, that's caused by respiratory depression during sleep. Do you remember I mentioned that the PCO2 tends to rise a little bit during sleep and some people get a more pronounced depression of respiration uh, and that's called central apnea. You can, you can distinguish between these two types because if you make measurements of uh, electromyograms, something like that, of the respiratory muscles, you can see that during obstructive sleep apnea, the subject is trying to breathe. The respiratory muscles are working hard against the obstruction, but in central sleep apnea, that's not the case. The uh, respiratory muscles are, are not trying to overcome the obstruction. There is no obstruction, and uh, the, it's, a, it's in central origin. And finally, let's, let me mention a type of periodic breathing which we see very commonly at high altitude in completely normal people. Uh, this periodic breathing is shown in the typical tracing here. Here we're measuring the, the excursions of the chest during breathing. Inspiration is down, expiration is up. And you can see that there are a few uh, large excursions. This is done actually by having a tape around the chest. And then after a series of big breaths, there's a period of apnea which may last 10, 15, even 20 seconds. And if you happen to be at high altitude and you're sharing a tent with somebody who shows sleep apnea, it's rather alarming because he, uh, uh, after a few breaths, he stops breathing and you wonder, is he ever going to start again? You know? But after 10 or 15 seconds, then these enormous big breaths occur. So this is called periodic breathing. It's almost universal at high altitude in normal subjects. Uh, you can see that in this particular tracing, someone was measuring the arterial oxygen saturation uh, using an oximeter. That's a device that measures the color of the blood. And uh, you can put a pulse oximeter on your finger. And you can see that the saturation is fluctuating the same rhythm as the periodic breathing, as you would expect. So that after the apnea periods, the saturation falls. Around about this point here, this particular subject was given oxygen to breathe. Saturation increased, as you can see, and the periodic breathing uh, largely went away. And it's known that periodic breathing is, is uh, uh, re certainly very greatly reduced or perhaps abolished by uh, breathing 100% oxygen. So let me now just briefly summarize some of the points we've made on this, uh, the control of ventilation. The first point we made was that it's remarkable how efficient the control systems of the body are in that the arterial PCO2, for example, only varies by two, three, four millimeters over the whole of the 24 hours. So it's, it's a very remarkable system. And this is brought about by having sensors which uh, look at the level of the blood gases and other things in the body, state of the lung, and they send information to the control system. There are three elements of the control system, as I mentioned. There's the central controller, mainly in the brain, but uh, mainly in the brain. And there are the effectors, which are the respiratory muscles, which we now know all about. And there are the sensors, mainly the chemoreceptors, but uh, other 
uh, sensors from the um, uh, other parts of the body, the uh, muscles, for example, and, uh, and joints and so on. Uh, we pointed out that the, the cortex has an important, or well, first of all, I should say that the, 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 the structures, the neurons responsible for the respiratory rhythm, the normal rhythm, are in the brain stem, in the medulla and the pons, particularly in the medulla. And there's a group of neurons called the pre-Botzinger complex, which is now believed to have a critical role in maintaining the normal respiratory rhythm. But uh, this, uh, the, the brain stem centers are also affected by other regions of the brain. For example, we pointed out that uh, vo there's voluntary control of ventilation. It's very easy to hyperventilate over a period of two or three minutes if you want to. Uh, not so easy to breath hold, but some people can do it for several minutes. Uh, we talked about the effectors, which are the respiratory muscles, and one point I didn't make, and I meant to, was that, that it's important that the respiratory muscles work in a coordinated fashion. And I say that because there's some evidence that newborn babies sometimes lack coordination in the action of their respiratory muscles. And this may be, some people think this may be, uh, play a role in the uh, infant respiratory distress syndrome, you know, cot deaths, where a, an infant is found dead in the cot, tragic situation, and, and uh, not fully understood. And it may be that, this, uh, that these infants lack the, the coordination of the respiratory muscles which they should have. We then went on to talk about the sensors. We talked about the central chemoreceptor, very important, the fact that it responds to the pH of the extracellular fluid, essentially the same as the cerebral spinal fluid, and that uh, the pH of the CSF uh, alters considerably because the buffering of the fluid is, is low. We also pointed out that the choroid plexus, which determines the composition of the CSF, is able to change the level of bicarbonate, and, and that is rather similar, and perhaps I didn't say this, rather similar to the metabolic compensation of respiratory acidosis and alkalosis. Uh, this is compensation in the CSF by the choroid plexus altering the level of bicarbonate. We then talked about the peripheral chemoreceptors, uh, the type 1, type 2 uh, glomus cells, the fact that the peripheral chemoreceptors are the most important receptors or the receptors who res that respond to, to the PO2 in the arterial blood. And for, it, for example, if you go to high altitude, it's the peripheral chemoreceptors that are responsible for increasing ventilation. And, uh, but they also respond to PCO2 and to pH. Uh, we pointed out that the peripheral chemoreceptors have a very high blood flow and uh, uh, therefore respond to arterial PO2 an important point because in some dangerous situations such as carbon monoxide poisoning, the ventilation does not increase. You'd think it would. I mean, it certainly would be very helpful if it did, but it doesn't increase. And uh, the reason is that the arterial PO2 is normal and therefore they don't change. We talked a bit about the pulmonary receptors, particularly the stretch receptors and the old classical herring broyer inflation reflex. Uh, we then went on to look at the at other res uh, receptors from the body, from the joints and some pain and, and, and other receptors. We talked about the, the integrated responses. First, the response to an increased PCO2 and how this is affected by the PO2 level in the blood. We talked about the integrated response to a fall in PO2 and the integrated response to a fall in pH. We pointed out that much to our embarrassment, we don't fully understand, or perhaps I should say I don't fully understand, the ventilatory response to exercise. And we finished by talking about abnormal patterns of ventilation in obstructive sleep apnea, very common condition. Some people regard it as an epidemic, actually. It's so common. And we referred to the periodic breathing at high altitude. So that concludes our session on the, uh, the control of ventilation, and I hope to see you next time.